went to school when I was seven years old, which, you know, 1941 was the year I started. And I went there for 10 years. And the 10 years I went to school, we did not go home. We stayed there the 10 months. In 1920, the Canadian government, through the Indian Act, made attendance to residential schools mandatory for First Nations children. But we never seen our parents. We never seen them. All right through we went to school, we never seen them. Yeah. Never seen the younger ones grow up. We stayed there. Must have took me about grade eight, grade nine, and I was laying in this field, and I was just thinking, oh, if I ever grow up and if I ever get the chance, I'm going back there. Nobody is going to do this to the rest of the kids, do what they done to us. Huh? And I did go back. We did fight. We changed a whole lot of stuff. I almost got fired a few times, but I still went for it. Had to be. It had to be done. Well, here's a picture of your man. That's yours. That's the one you wanted no, to marry. No, 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 no. Don't pass him on to me. He wants to marry you. <laughs> I believe this is the school my mother used to sit on a roof. Okay. When they had procession. Yeah. Yeah, it does look like it has the window. The Indian residential school system inflicted misery upon thousands of children across the country. Lifelong friends Doris Belgard and Anita McLeod were two such children. They attended the Coppell Indian Residential School in Labret, Saskatchewan. Yet despite their experiences there, they returned as adults to fight for change. I guess we're walking down old memory lane. Yep. Closing the door behind us. <laughs> Down the hallways. Yeah. Heading into the dining rooms. Out the back door. Oh, incidentally, they had a back door to this, too. Actually, they had quite a few doors there. Eh? Yeah. All locked. Because believe me, I tried every one of them. <laughs> the first day I got there, I remember crying and crying because I saw my parents leaving and I thought, you know, I'm never going to see them again, which was true. I didn't see them for a long time, and it was hard. I cried and I cried, but there was nothing else I could do. I was seven years old, and it started from the from the, the Catholic Church on the reserve. That's where we gathered, and we were piled into um, a cattle truck, and from there we were taken down to Labret. And when I got there, the nun, I had long braids, I had long, long braids. The nun that was in charge cut my braids right off. I was lonesome, I was scared, I was crying, and. I was really crying, and I remember crying really hard. And that's the first licking I got. I got a really, really good licking for being lonesome and for, be, for crying. And church was always something we always had. We'd get up in the morning, six o'clock, go to church, say our prayer for about half an hour, and then from there went down to breakfast. After breakfast, we had to go and do our chores you know, clean the floors, uh, because we had no janitors. 
We'd wash the stairs, uh, do our beds, sweep the floor in the playroom, do the bathroom, and then go to class. Our class started about quarter to nine. We had a, a break about 10, 10, 15. Then we had lunch at 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock again, we had to do our chores again, do our dishes. After that, we went back to the classroom till about quarter to four, four o'clock. Then we came down and we had about, say about half an hour free time. That wasn't much of a free time because we had some chores that we had to do. Because we had a routine, Monday was wash day, Tuesday was ironing day, Wednesday was mending day, you know. There was all, every day was scheduled for some kind of a work. Once a month, we had to wash our, all the windows or we were never had a free time. It was always work, clean up, pray, did a lot of praying. And then we had supper time. Clean up again, you know. Then from there we had a study period. We studied every night from seven o'clock till nine o'clock. And from there, again, we'd have to go and say our prayer, get on our knees every night, say our rosary, and then to bed. Next morning, the same thing. That was my younger sister. Well, she used to wet her bed. I slept beside her, thank God for that. And when I found out she'd wet her bed, I'd pull her sheets off and put them on mine and give her my dry sheets and that. Because if you wet your bed, you got a really good, good licking. It was nothing for them to hit us. Yeah, and I mean a real good hit, like I've been knocked flat on onto the cement floor with one good slap. And we were little girls. My mother was a, went to school in Labrat. And in her time, it was like very strict, her too. So uh, she was uh, looking out the window one time and she didn't know, she saw some boys passing by, but that was way quite a ways, you know, from even where she was. And there were some girls at the bottom and she was gonna talk to this girl at the bottom and she got caught. So the nun took her in a playroom. And this was kind of must have been late in the afternoon because uh, at that night, that evening, they made her go in a corner and they put a clothespin on her tongue. And this must have been seven, eight o'clock. Well, before that. But anyway, she was in there till two o'clock in the morning in the playroom. In the corner, kneeling, all wet. The priest caught her and asked her, you know, why are you here? She said, I don't know. You know, those are things that hurt. The Sister Lacroix was, uh the devil in disguise. Doesn't matter, I didn't say it. She was so cruel, she, I knew she didn't like us. We couldn't do anything right for her, no matter what we did, we could. I was really young, but I remember all that. Like, and I was so scared of her. And it wasn't just me, it was all the rest of the class, all the rest of the, the students. Because she hit so hard, and she had no, no remorse or anything, she just hit. One of our classmates was really sick, our, our students, huh? And this nun made her go to the dining room and she had a bowl of porridge and we all served a bowl of porridge which we had to eat. Whether we liked it or not, we had to eat it. And this girl was so sick, well, she threw up in her, her porridge, yeah? And that nun come in the back and took her from the back of the head and rubbed her face in it and tried to make her eat it. But she couldn't, she just, just cause she was just too sick. But somehow or other we got her to the, to the department and her mother found out about this. Her mother found out about what happened. Eh? So she came down and she took this Sister Lacroix, which I thoroughly enjoyed, and gave her a 
really, really terrible licking. Just really beat her right there. Pulled her habit off, everything, just beat her up. And we were really small, eh? we were sitting there and we were dead scared. We were scared. This was, hey, it was a big fight. I've seen men fight, but not women. Eh? But anyway, the mother left, took her daughter and left. After she left, that nun lined us up. And she came and she slapped every one of us right to the floor, all the way down the road, like that. Just all, I guess all 42, 45 of us, minus the student, one student. And she told us, when something like this happens, you're to help me fight and you're to help me defend me. Why the heck, we couldn't do it, we were too small. I don't think there was anybody older than eight, nine years old in there. We had a great big garden. This was all garden down here. But right along here we had fence, a high fence, eight foot high fence. And uh, along the fence, one day the girls saw the, they found an opening. If you were thin enough, you were able to slide underneath that opening and go and get some vegetables from the garden. We had lots of chickens, we had a lot of cattle, but we didn't get to eat the meat. We didn't hardly get any eggs. We were never given fruit. The food was not what we liked to have eaten, but we had to eat it. We were given porridge, which we all, you know, all had to eat, it was very lumpy porridge. We had cut up bologna, we had boiled bologna, we had uh, porridge that like, to this day, I really don't eat porridge. Up the hill, we, we had potatoes. We had fields of potatoes. And every year, the boys went and they dug the potatoes. And then we went up and bagged them. We bagged all, all the potatoes, left them there, and then the boys would come and load them. But while we were going up there and they were coming down, they threw potatoes at us. <laughs> We'd eat them. <laughs> Yeah, he had lots of stuff here. But unfortunately, we didn't. We had meals set for a king, and those were for, that meal went to the priest. Then we had another meal that was set, like made out for the for the nuns, and that was a real good meal. And what we had was terrible, like. You know, I cry sometimes yet at night when I think about it because of the, the meal. <laughs> I used to want to go in the back room and cry, you know, and think, why are they eating? You know, they're not kings. You know, in my books, they're not kings. They're just slave drivers making us do all the work and they're eating all the, the good stuff. I used to feel bad, but there was nothing I could do then. You know, I thought, I'm coming back and I'm gonna change all this, and I did. It made me feel good. In the snow. It's easier walking in the <laughs> snow because it holds you. Yes. When you're heavy like us, you gotta have a, <laughs> a good base. This is where the statue was. After leaving the Coppell Indian Residential School in the early 1950s, both women married and began families. As their children grew older, both Doris and Anita returned to Labrette to work at the very school built to destroy them. And I, you know, I thought, I'm going to come and change some of the things now that have happened to me. 
It didn't happen right, right away. I think it was when all the nuns started leaving because we were only stuck with the nun that I had to work with. And I remember this one, that one time when I was working there and I told her, I said, uh, well, what's for lunch today? Well, are you going to give them bologna? So she gives me this big bologna and it was green and slimy. And she said, you cut that up for supper. And I pushed it at her and I said, no, I'm not touching that. I thought, today I'm going to stand up for it, for, for my rights. <laughs> so I said, I'm not feeding the kids that. She said, yes, you are. I said, no, I'm not. She pushed it to me and I pushed it back. And she said, uh, I said, that's what you're going to give the kids? And I said, no. I said, you tell me one more time and I'm going to report you. I said, I'm going to phone Health Canada. And I didn't know who Health Canada was or anything. But I said, I'm going to report you. She said, well, we're going to fire you. You're not going to be working here anymore. And I said, that's fine. You can fire me all you want, but I'm still going, still going to get Health Canada to come and check you out. Because I said, the stuff you feed us weren't even fit for the pigs. So she took this bologna and she put it away. And she said, okay, you cook something else. I think I took, cooked hamburger. But from there on, I start changing the menu. I thought, you're not feeding the, feeding the kids the way you fed us. I started working there as a childcare worker. Yeah, we had quite a bit of settling to do there too. There was lots, there was lots of stuff going on. Eh? There was lots. Of, already, I think they were rebelling. The the kids start rebelling towards uh, the nuns and the whatever, whoever was there, because they were still like they tried to run them with a with an iron fist. Well, that day and age already, that was a that was getting to be a no-no. You didn't do that to kids. Oh, they were, they didn't want us to say anything. They didn't want us to defend the kids. But like, I'm going to take it. I didn't. They had every right to be defended. You know, I mean, they, we kept punishment, but we took out, say, there was no beatings. The strapping, the strap was taken completely out. They threatened to fire me and I told them, no, go ahead. Go ahead, I told him, I'll use everybody and anybody I can to make sure that you don't continue what you're doing. And I got away with it. I stayed here for 25 years. <laughs> yeah, but like I told you, we got stronger. Uh, workers seemed to join us. And well, they seen it, eh? Especially the ones that had children seemed to know that, hey, this is not right. I wouldn't do this to my kids. Nobody's doing it to these. And that's what made us strong. In 1998, the residential school in Labrette closed its doors for good. In March of the following year, demolition began. I think I spent my life in this school. I came here for 10 years, then I worked for 32 years. A lot of good memories and a lot of bad memories. But you know, to be truthful, I'm, I, I am glad it's gone. I really am. I don't know what, what's with me, but I am. I'm glad it's gone. In 
In September 2007, the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement was implemented, the largest and most comprehensive settlement in Canadian history. A settlement to me doesn't mean anything to me. No, there's no money that would make up for the damage that I have done. You know, it's, there's no money really that would replace of all the times that we spent in school. What I think it means is it's settling their minds, not ours. That's their settlement. That's not our settlement. Oh, yeah, we received the money and that, but it, well, I guess what it really comes down to is it's, uh, it's easing their minds, huh? It's uh, making them come to terms with, hey, we give them money, they won't complain. But it's not like that. It's not like that. It's just, it's just not like that. There's no way. No. It doesn't use anything. <laughs>